popular walkway to the sand is now marked off as private property. But the question is, should it be? Should it be? Should it be? In many countries in Europe, there exists a fundamental right to roam, an ancient custom that allows anyone to wander in open countryside, whether the land is privately or publicly owned. In fact, Sweden is so proud of the fact that its natural lands are accessible to everyone that the Swedish Tourism Board famously listed the entire country on Airbnb in 2017. Gorgeous photos of riverbanks, forest glens, and rocky beaches beckoning users to experience the countryside. And it's all completely free of charge, thanks to a freedom granted by the Constitution of Sweden called Allemansrätten, or every man's right. But coming from the United States, where no trespassing signs, fences, and boundaries that effectively say, this land is my land, not your land, well, the concept in Europe seems a little bit outlandish, to say the least. So why do Europeans see access to nature as a basic human right, but Americans view the wild frontier as largely off limits? Where do property rights end and human rights begin? Well, let's take a look. And the skies are not The right to roam, also known as the freedom to roam, is an ancient custom that allows anyone to wander in the open countryside, whether the land is privately or publicly owned. In countries such as Norway, Sweden, Estonia, and Scotland, it has existed as a common right, a defining concept of nationhood, and has only recently been codified into law. Although the names and specifics vary by country, the concept is relatively the same. The general public is granted non-motorized access to certain public or private lands for responsible recreational use. One may travel through by foot, ski, horse, bike, or boat, as well as forage and sometimes even fish on uncultivated lands without the landowner's explicit permission. Camping for one or two nights is permissible even in some countries provided the user does not camp within close proximity of the landowner's home or in their gardens or on agricultural areas. Although fair warning, economic pursuits like fishing, hunting, or foraging for goods that you plan on selling, as well as activities that could harm the land, like lighting fires, are generally not allowed. Although there might be some exceptions from one country to another. And those who roam may not disturb or damage wildlife or crops refrain from making too much noise, and are expected to pick up all their trash, leaving the area in better condition than it was found. And with this freedom to roam, nature isn't really treated like a museum piece, something that should be experienced from afar or behind a barbed wire fence. Instead, it becomes something to be deeply immersed in, a multi-sensory, tangible experience whose smells, sounds, sights can have a profound effect upon the minds of their beholders. And there's a long-term effect too. Nature is no longer relegated to occasional visits, but instead becomes a part of people's everyday routine, woven into their lives, helping to relieve stress and promoting mental and physical health. But what I think is so fascinating about many countries' right to roam laws is that in some of these countries, it wasn't even a law in the first place. Fundamentally, the right to roam arises from the principle of nulla poenia sina lega, which means what is not illegal cannot be punished. Things that are not explicitly disallowed are allowed by default. That's why today the right to roam has survived in perhaps its purest form in Estonia, Finland, Iceland, Norway, and Sweden. But the freedom to roam didn't always exist, and in some countries, it's a freedom that many are still fighting for. Take England, for example. Almost a third of England's land is still owned by the aristocracy, and one in eight UK households don't even have access to a garden, a statistic that rises to one in five in London. And many of these aristocratic estates are the product of a thousand-year history of enclosure, the theft of land that had been previously held in common, 
Entire villages were forcibly evicted so that land could be subsumed into large estates and adapted for agricultural use and private profit. So that's why in April of 1932, hundreds of ramblers from Manchester and Sheffield set off for the highest points in the peaks. They were intending to highlight the gross unfairness of the severely limited rights to access an outstandingly beautiful area of country which was rarely farmed by its wealthy aristocratic owner, but instead kept only for occasional hunting and game shooting. The walk would go down in history as the Kinder Scout Mass Trespass of 1932, named after the Moreland Plateau, and would later be seen as a seminal moment in the struggle for public access to private land. And even outside of England, there are still major landowners in Norway, counts in Sweden, lords in Scotland who own many hundreds of thousands of acres. But the difference in these countries is that their ownership of the land, however, while it does allow them to take rent, mine, and make money from the land, it does not include the right to exclude every other member of the public. In these countries, the right to roam is so fundamentally ingrained in the health and well-being of the nation that the right to roam supersedes any exclusionary tendencies of private property law. Instead, every person has the right to explore these vast open spaces, in some cases even to sleep there, to kayak, swim, climb, ride horses, and cycle. In 2000, England did pass the Countryside and Rights of Way, or the Crow Act, which gave a partial right to roam over about 8% of England. For the last two decades, they have had legal access to walk over certain landscapes, mountain moor commons and some downland and coastlines, without the fear of trespassing. But these sites are often remote, meaning that access to land has become a postcode lottery, available to those who live next to it, or who can afford the cost of travel and overnight stays. But here in Germany, the right to roam is more robust than what currently exists in England, but is quite a bit more limited than what you see in Northern Europe. Because here in Germany, the right to roam, also known as Betretungsrecht, is guaranteed by multiple federal laws, most notably the Federal Nature Conservation Act, the Federal Forest Act, and the Federal Water Management Act that collectively allow everyone access to the open landscape, uncultivated land, forests, and bodies of water, including cycling and horse riding on tracks and paths. However, unlike Northern Europe, free camping is strictly forbidden in Germany. But that being said, the Constitution of Bavaria guarantees everyone the right of enjoyment of natural beauty and recreation in the outdoors, in particular the access to forests and mountain meadows, the use of waterways and lakes, and the appropriation of wild fruits and edibles. That right is actually nicknamed Schrammer Paragraph or the Mushroom Clause. But the article also obliges every person to treat nature and the landscape with care. And I think that's really a major point because at its core, the right to roam is about both equality and environmentalism. Two things that, well, frankly, haven't always been so easy to come by in the United States. The right to roam assures that outdoor recreational activities are permitted wherever they are not explicitly implied. But in the United States, the opposite holds true. And you know, that's something that I find somewhat surprising given just how vast and also how young the United States is as a nation. After all, the American story is one of the Wild West, exploration and adventure. And perhaps no single story in our entire history is more emboldened by this uncharted frontier than the frontiersmen and women themselves. The American prairie was a vast and uncharted expanse of tall, tough grasses and land suitable for nomads, not settlers. It had long been the territory of the Native Americans, and the prairie was an unbounded space, more like an ocean than a stretch of arable land. But after the passage of the Homestead Act of 1862, those looking to stake a claim for themselves pushed west. The cowboys roamed free herding cattle over the boundless plains. But those settlers needed fences, not least to keep those free-roaming cattle from trampling their crops. And there wasn't a lot of wood, certainly none to spare for fencing, in mile after mile of what was often called 
the American desert. Farmers tried growing thorn bush hedges, but they were slow growing and inflexible. Smooth wire fences didn't work either, as the cattle simply pushed through them. So for much of the early American West, private ownership of land wasn't really all that common because it really wasn't all that feasible. But then along came barbed wire, and it changed what the Homestead Act could not. The homesteading farmers were trying to stake out their property, property that had once been the territory of various Native American tribes. No wonder these tribes called barbed wire the devil's rope. The old time cowboys also lived on the principle that cattle could graze freely across the plains. This was the law of the open range. And the cowboys hated the wire. Cattle would get nasty wounds and infections, and when the blizzards came, the cattle would try to head south and sometimes they got stuck against the wire and died in the thousands. However, other cowmen did adopt barbed wire, using it to fence off huge private ranches. And while barbed wire could enforce legal boundaries, many fences were actually illegal, attempts to commandeer common land for private purposes. But it's certainly true that modern economies are built on the legal fact that most things, including land and property, have an owner usually a person or a corporation. And the ability to own private property also gives people an incentive to invest in and improve what they own, whether that's a patch of land in the American Midwest or an apartment in New York City. And it's a powerful argument. It was ruthlessly and cynically deployed by those who wanted to argue that, hey, Native Americans didn't really have a right to their own territory, because they weren't actively developing it in a style that the Europeans saw fit. So the story how barbed wire changed the West is also very much a story of how property rights have transformed the modern world. I mean, absolutely. The Homestead Act very much laid out who owned what in the new Western territories, but those laws couldn't really be enforced until fences entered into the conversation. And so today, Americans still live with a pretty rigid definition and delineation of what is mine versus yours, quite literally. We preach the notion that good fences make good neighbors, and resultingly, the majority of the U.S. landscape is unknown to the general public because by law of trespass, we're banned from setting foot on it in the first place. We're excluded from millions of acres of open space, woodland, meadows, rivers, and their banks, simply because existing laws of ownership prioritize private property rights and not the accessibility of nature to the public. Today in the United States, roughly 60% of land is privately owned, either by individuals or corporations. The remaining 40% is owned by federal, state, or local governments. The majority of those public lands are administered by the United States Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management, whose agencies of the federal government include about 640 million acres of land, about 28% of the total land area of 2.27 billion acres. Any person, including non-citizens, can legally access and recreate on these lands lawfully, sometimes referred to as the North American model of land conservation. But some cities and local governments put more restrictive covenances on those public lands, whether it's through loitering or redlining or outright banning certain groups of individuals from accessing public lands altogether. In St. Louis, Missouri, for example, the government banishes many unhoused people and other vulnerable populations from large areas of the city. These are areas that include public land, and many of the organizations that provide shelter, meals, and care to St. Louis's homeless population. Those who violate the orders have been jailed for months. And just like it was in the early days of the American frontier, in the United States, knowing who owns what land is incredibly important. Because land ownership affects how wealth is distributed nationally, as well as how land is used. Access to land is deeply biased against large sections of our society. 200 years ago, the working class were still intrinsically connected to the countryside. 
Even as late as the 1930s, rambling and cycling were seen as primarily working class hobbies, accompanied by a strong understanding that nature was needed to counteract the hard, cramped lifestyles of urban dwelling. Only very recently has the countryside become the preserve of the middle and upper classes. From country club memberships to outdoor recreation shops, the leisure industry dominates our access to the countryside. Now even the experience of nature has become something you can purchase, a commodity for those who can afford it. And I'm not just talking about hiking paths or horseback riding trails. Half of the population of the US lives within 50 miles of the coast, but 70% of coastal land is privately owned and the percentage is increasing all the time. And fences, boundaries, and private property laws manifest a number of tensions between exclusionary aspirations rooted in fear and protection of privilege and the values of civic responsibility, between the trend towards privatization of public services and the ideals of public good and general welfare, and between the need for personal and community control of the environment and the perceived dangers of making outsiders of fellow citizens. So in the absence of right to roam laws, the United States has kind of swung wildly in the opposite direction with increasingly deadly consequences. 65 year old man in upstate New York is facing murder charges after he allegedly shot and killed a woman who authorities say accidentally turned into his driveway. Kevin Monahan. Because in most states, the property line, not the entrance of the home, is the boundary for trespassing. And trespassing is considered a criminal offense. In the US, you are allowed to use physical force against a trespasser if you reasonably believe that it is necessary to prevent criminal interference with your property. And in 45 states with castle doctrine laws, you can actually use deadly force if you reasonably believe that it is necessary to protect yourself or someone else from the imminent use of deadly physical force or to prevent the commission of a dangerous felony such as arson or burglary. Now I should give a giant disclaimer here. The use of deadly force has to be appropriate, justifiable, and proportional to the threat. And I get that that can be somewhat open to interpretation, but legally speaking, it has to be justifiable. Get on Get off my lawn. So despite what Hollywood movies and signs like this might lead you to believe, it is in fact entirely illegal to set up a booby trap on your property that could injure or kill trespassers. You guys give up or you're thirsty for more? And in fact, the courts have actually upheld rulings that even make firing a warning shot illegal since this still amounts to lethal force beyond what is reasonably necessary. But this fear that you could be injured or even killed for walking onto a property when you're not really sure who it belongs to is, is so pervasive in the American psyche um, that I, you know, speaking from personal experience, it's definitely kept me from walking in an open field because I really wasn't sure who it belonged to. And this fear isn't unfounded. It's worth mentioning that some states, in order to quell this fear, have passed laws that do provide for some limited forms of public access to private lands. For example, in some Western states, such as Montana and Colorado, people can access certain types of public lands, such as rivers and streams, by crossing private lands without trespassing. Other states such as Maine and Vermont have passed right to roam laws that allow people to access certain types of private lands, such as coastal areas and abandoned railroad beds for recreational purposes. However, these laws are often incredibly unclear and they vary significantly from one municipality to the next. And so this fear of not being able to really fully enjoy all of the outdoors, especially even the great outdoors, it's just so vastly different from what happens right here in Europe. All right, guys, so it's time for my final question of the video. And it's a big one. 
Proponents of the right to roam argue that it promotes physical activity, environmental stewardship, and mental health by encouraging people to spend more time outdoors. They also claim that it is a democratic right that allows everyone, regardless of their socioeconomic status, to access and enjoy public lands. In addition, they argue that the right to roam can have positive economic effects by stimulating outdoor recreation and tourism. However, opponents argue that it undermines private property rights, reduces landowners' incentives to maintain their properties, and can lead to trespassing, vandalism, and littering. They also claim that it can pose a threat to public safety by exposing people to dangerous terrain or wild animals. So what are your thoughts on the right to roam? Do good fences make good neighbors? Or is access to the outdoors a fundamental human right? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. And as always, if you enjoyed what you saw today, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. And for more content from the Black Forest family, hit that subscribe button. So I'll see you next Sunday. Juice.